All right, guys, so if you need a Bible, we have some in the back. You can grab one. If you don't um, need one, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. And let's pray. Jesus, we want to come before you tonight and ask, Lord, that you, your Holy Spirit, would teach us, Lord, these things, that as we consider your word and even a passage or a book that maybe we're very familiar with, um, that even we know a lot about or, or maybe we don't, but just we pray that your word would speak to us tonight. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts in only the way you can. And so we pray, Lord, that you would bring application to our lives personally. Um, Lord, we pray that you would be speaking to us and stirring our hearts up to draw closer to you, to follow you, to, go, to be sent out to preach the gospel, to, to share with everyone we know of the love of Christ. And so speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, full disclosure, the next three Wednesdays um, I will be teaching. So that will give you a warning not to come back next week. Um, I'm just kidding. But uh, we're in thinking that and thinking I have three consecutive Wednesdays, typically you know, Rich isn't gone that much, and so we'll, you know, we'll, I'll do one Wednesday, and then won't do another Wednesday for several weeks or months even. And so, in thinking of three consecutive ones, my first thought was, you know, it'd be cool to maybe do like um, a Titus or a Timothy, but in Sunday mornings, we're already in those chapters or in those books of the Bible. So, um, one thing I've learned um, being coming here is I'll never, ever teach out of the same passage Rich does. It's the same week. It just It just won't happen. It, it'll be like... It just, it'll be like going to a, like a major league baseball game and then going to like a triple A baseball game. Like, are you guys playing the same sport? Or So um, anyway, so it, it, and, and just praying and kind of thinking about the different um, just things that were on my heart and, and things that I, I was wanting to share. The book of Romans kind of just stuck out me personally in my own life and then um, just thought it would be really, really good book to spend a couple weeks in. Now it's a long book, so we're not going to do it all in three weeks, but, um, but we'll tackle some, some um, pretty cool points in the first couple chapters. So if you're probably familiar, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, or um, really doesn't have to be, even be a long time, you're probably familiar with the book of Romans. It's typically a book that you first read when you're um, a new Christian, or, or a, a book that's recommended to people oftentimes uh, when, they're, when they're starting out walking with the Lord, or, or even some, um, I remember I had a friend have, have another guy read the book before he was a Christian as, as kind of a letter or a book to uh, persuade him that the gospel was real, that Jesus is who he says he is. And so um, it's a very effective book. It's a book that I think we probably should, should know well, um, at least the context in it. Um, you can try to memorize it. It's a pretty long book. So if you, mem- if you guys have good memories, you can do that if you'd like. Um, it's a book that's probably had uh, maybe the biggest impact in church history. Now, certainly the Bible in its whole, obviously, has impacted the world to a degree that no other book has um, because it's the inspired word of God. It's truth. You know, there's nothing like that. But as far as church history goes, the book of Romans has, um, has been used greatly in some of the great revivals we've had. Uh, John Wesley, I believe, was at a prayer meeting uh, one time who uh, he, I guess he was, would proclaim, or at least he would say he's a Christian, uh, but he was at a prayer meeting, and he said he heard teachings from the gospel of Romans and realized that he needed to get saved, and got saved at this prayer meeting from listening from teachings to the, to the Romans, uh, through Romans. He famously, in his journal, two months prior to that prayer meeting, he wrote, I'm traveling to America uh, to, um, to evangelize to the Indians, but who will evangelize me, or something to that effect. Like, I'm going to, to save Indians, but who will save me? You know, just that expression of him, him doubting if he was really saved. And then being at a prayer meeting, hearing the teachings from the Book of Romans, and then saying, no, I need to get saved. And then that would spark the great revivals in England in his day. Um, the, maybe the most famous is Martin Luther, Was grew up in the Catholic uh, circle, and and for himself, wanted to read the Word of God. The Catholic Church would not let the common people read the Word. They didn't want the Word to be exposed to common people. They thought it was only for the, the, the priest and the, the educated. And, and for and studying the Word, because he wanted to be a priest, he came across Romans, and it said, the just shall live by faith. 
and we'll get to that verse tonight, but he read that portion and, and it sparked something then because his whole life he was taught that the just shall live by works. And if you want to go to heaven, then you need to do these certain works. You need to eat a certain way. You need to act a certain way. That's how you get to heaven. And when he gets to a, a Bible verse that says the just shall live by faith and believing in God only, then it really turned his world upside down and started um, what we call the Reformation. Uh, George Whitfield famously preached a sermon um, to the clergy that the clergy should get saved, which is a good sermon to preach, right? I mean, your pastor should be Christians is, is kind of the point of that, right? George Whitfield, understanding that the Church of England in that day, uh, it was kind of a, you became maybe in ministry or part of the clergy because it, it gave you a certain status or an income, but really you didn't um, truly believe it. And he was a part of that and got saved, and then preached a sermon to the pastors to get saved. Uh, Donald uh, Bar Barnhouse is an interesting guy. He wrote a 10-volume commentary on the book of Romans. The first verse has 20, or the first chapter has 27 Bible studies. Just that's the first chapter. Now, we're not going to spend all that time going over every word as he did, but just to put it into perspective, some, the book of Romans has impacted people in a way that they just get super zealous for God over it. You know, uh, Martin Luther turned really the Catholic Church in Germany upside down and, and really started, you know, we call it Reformation, but it really penetrated and gave, you know, he was able to translate the, the Bible into the common language so people could read it for themselves and grow and learn from it. Uh, George, George Whitfield was a fiery preacher that um, was effective all over England and then in, even into the States, preached the gospel to Benjamin Franklin in that day. Um, so the, the, the book of Romans, and I share all this because it's, it's, you know, not to somehow persuade you guys that the book of Romans is an awesome book. I could have just said it's an awesome book. You guys would believe me. But I'm hoping that in the next couple weeks um, you guys see the, the, as, as these men read it and men, other men like them and other women like them, as they read it and they were stirred up to, to learn of the simplicity that's in Christ, the, the power of the gospel, the truth that it speaks, that it would stir our hearts to do the same, to preach the gospel. Paul, in, in, in our passage we're even going to look at tonight, will say, I'm ready to preach the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He would say in other parts that, you know, Lord, you know, if I don't, you know, if I don't preach the gospel, what am I doing? Like, what am I here for? And so the purpose of those things, um, he wrote this letter um, to the church there in Rome. But the difference between some of the other letters is he had never actually been to Rome yet, which is a very interesting um, thing to think about when you when you consider some of Paul's writings are usually very intimate, usually very specific about a certain church problem or certain thing that is happening, but the book of Romans is more of a, just a doctrinal statement of saying, like, look, this is, this is the gospel. This is, this is man's problem is sin, and the, the way to fix it is God's redemption, and God made a plan for us to be redeemed. And it's just a, the, the most simple writing, the most profound writing, if those two words can be in the same sentence, uh, about the gospel and the man's, man's um, sin and then God's plan for redemption. It's just such a great book. So he wrote this, not ever been, having gone to Rome. Um, he, we know that um, a girl named Phoebe delivered it to them. So um, what her, you know, one of, one of Paul's friends, he wrote the letter, gave it to, to them and, and sent it on the way. We know that he knew a few people in Rome, although he hadn't been there. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila had, uh, were apparently there because in the chapter 16, he, he, he writes a list of people that he knows. Hey, hey, say hi to this person. Say hi to that person. And Priscilla and Aquila, I point them out because he says that, uh, say hi to them for they, for they risk their necks for me. And tell them I thank you, <laughs> right? He, he you know, says, look, these guys, whatever they did, I can't wait to meet them in heaven. He said, what did you guys do for Paul? Like, how did you risk your neck? You know, did you, you know, what'd you do? And the, but Paul mentions them and said, look, these guys almost died. They risked their lives for, for me and for the gospel's sake and for, for the other churches. So, so Paul certainly had some people that he knew there. Um, we, we're not sure exactly how the gospel got to Rome. Um, we know that there were some people from Rome on the day of Pentecost. Uh, certainly could have happened then. 
Um, certainly all roads le- led to Rome, and so the people traveling to and from Jerusalem and different parts of the area certainly could have gotten saved. But as far as we know, uh, Paul certainly hadn't been there. Peter probably hadn't, well, maybe he had been there. We, we don't have any record of that yet. Uh, so we're not sure exactly if there was an apostle that went there, but we obviously know that the gospel was, was um, spread there. Now, Rome was a city not much different than uh, many big cities that we live in that are here today. Um, sometimes, and it's been said before, I know Rich has said it before, sometimes we think of the Bible times as some sort of like cavemen or some sort of, you know, they didn't have the, the knowledge that we have or the technology that we have, and so they were just kind of naive or ignorant men and women in those days, and they didn't really, weren't sophisticated like we are today. Well, that wasn't Rome. I mean, if you ever seen pictures of the Colosseum, they built that 2,000 years ago. So does it, would it, you know, it's not some mud, you know, some mud fixture where they say, oh, look at my nice Colosseum. It's going to wash out when the rain comes. I mean, it's a massive, massive structure that's been able to stand for the most part for a couple thousand years. The Roman Empire had taken really over the, all the known world. They were very powerful. Um, you know, they, they implemented their, their own language, you know, or they, not their own language, but, you know, just the, the common language. They look, everybody's going to speak this language. Um, everybody's going to pay this tax, have this currency. Uh, Rome, very sophisticated empire, and, and the city of Rome in particular was the hub of all that. It's where all the Caesars would live, all the, um, you know, people in, in politics, they would all be from Rome. So all that, putting all that in perspective, Paul writes this amazing letter to these guys. And the letter is going to consist of, really, Paul's argument for, for the sin of man. He's going he's gonna to make, make mention of the sin. You know, he's not going to let anybody off the hook. The Jews aren't off the hook. The Gentiles aren't off the hook. The self-righteous aren't off the hook. The heathen aren't off the hook. The, you know, the people who idol worship. He's going he's gonna to address every person that you can think of, or any culture or any, any lifestyle, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna hit on almost every lifestyle. And if you think, well, Paul doesn't understand the cultures of today. What about the lifestyles that they, live, that they have today? Well, Paul addresses them. Idolatry, homosexuality, um, paganism. Like everything that you know, we deal with today or the issues that are hot today or they're, they're a hot topic today, they were hot topic then. And Paul addresses them and, and speaks truth about them. So he opens up his letter and he says, Paul, um, letting us know that's who wrote it. And this is going to be the next seven verses are going to be a traditional, somewhat traditional intro that Paul has. He says, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And I love this about Paul that um, not in every introduction that he has, but in most introductions, if you went into all the letters that Paul wrote, you would see that he uses this word or a word like this, a servant of God or or, you know, some implying that he, he's some instrument used by God. And he uses the word bondservant, which is interesting for, for our sake tonight because he's writing to the church in Rome where it was estimated that probably 60 million people in the, were slaves in the Roman Empire. 60 million people working outside of working to pay off some debt that they that they they accumulated or something that they they don't want to work there but they have to work there because they're being forced to or they have to pay off something or they owe some taxes that are unreasonable tax or some sort of thing there was there was many reasons why you would be a slave but but here paul uses a specific word bond servant slave but here's the difference that he uses he's not a slave to rome Paul doesn't say, I'm a bondservant to Rome, or I'm a bondservant to Caesar, or I'm a bondservant to, you know, whatever Nero, or, you know, whoever was in charge. He says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And it's important that, that Paul understood that he, was a, he was, that, that he had a master. You know, people will say that they, no, they're not enslaved to anything. You know, they'll say, I'm not, a, you know, you'll tell someone, you're enslaved to your sin. It's like, I'm not a slave. No one's telling me. No one's, no one's telling me what to do. Well, everybody's a slave to something. It's just a matter of what you're enslaved to. You know, if you're enslaved to drugs or alcohol or power or money or respect, you know, we're all slaves to something. But Paul understood that he was also a slave, but he was a slave to Jesus Christ. He was a slave to, to the master. And he, he had that perspective. He understood that. And so he says, I'm a bondservant. Um, 
and, and, and there's times where Paul also says that we're also bond servants. Um, it's interesting. I, it, the verse doesn't necessarily, in Matthew 8, um, the verse doesn't really, uh, I wouldn't say you can draw application out of this verse for this, for this particular topic, but in, in Mark chapter 8, there, or Matthew chapter 8, there was a man who came to Jesus who uh, wanted, um, who wanted something from Jesus and needed, needed um, I think it was his daughter, to be healed. And he came to Jesus and says, I'm also a man under authority. Um, I have servants that are under me, soldiers who are under me, that if I tell my servants to do this, they do that. If I tell them to go here, they go there. If I tell them to bring me something, they bring it. And in and, and, and that response or that statement that he says to Jesus that, hey, I also have bond servants. I also have servants that say whatever I tell them to do, they do it. And Jesus responded with, man, there was no greater statement that here's this man who has this authority and this, and this power, and yet he was coming to Jesus in such humility and saying, hey, I'm recognizing that you have the authority. And just like my servants would do whatever I say, I'm willing to do whatever you say. And so, um, so it's such a great word. It's not a a word that we, you know, that my translation says bondservant. Now, I think the old King James, I think, still used the word slave. Uh, slave has a really a negative connotation, especially um, in our culture, for sure. And then he says this, called to be an apostle, or you can say called an apostle. Um, one thing to note when you're reading your Bible, when you see words in italics, they are there, they're put there later on by the people who put together the, the actual Bible, the, you know, put together the books and put it in a form that we call the Holy Bible or the whatever, you know, uh, format you want to call it. Uh, they were put there to sometimes make more sense of the passage. Like, what, you know, if you, if you put this to be, then it kind of makes a better understanding. Um, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. We'll find out later, we'll find out in a certain section that it, you know, shouldn't even be there. But called to be an apostle... An apostle, um, we think of, obviously, John, Peter, you know, Matthew, these, the, the 12 that Jesus chose, you know, minus Judas, but we believe Paul kind of replaced that. And we look at these guys as apostles, but really the word meant to, it means to be sent out. We get the Latin word missionary, or the, 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 the word missionary comes as the Latin root or Latin form of that, that Greek word, uh, apostle. It just means to be sent out. And what I want to say about this is, Paul uses these words, and, and I believe that, and obviously he's inspired by the Word of God, but I think he uses these words in this order in particular, that Paul understood he was a servant of Jesus first, then he was an apostle. He was a, Jesus was his master. He was going to do whatever Jesus told him to do. He was going to be a servant of God first, and then he's an apostle. Then he's, he's the one that's sent out. And, and I think Paul purposely does that. So that's the second thing he says. The third thing he says is separated to the gospel of God. And Paul's, um, if, you, you know, if you know anything about Paul or have read the book of Acts, you know that his, really, his main ministry was to be sent out to preach the gospel, to bring the gospel to places no one else wanted to go sometimes, uh, bring, the gospel that the, bring the gospel to places that it had never been before. Um, in fact, he wrote to the Romans that he says, uh, I've wanted to come to you, and I've wanted to be there with you, um, and I've heard of your faith, but I haven't, I didn't, you know, I want to make sure that I didn't step on anybody's toes. I don't want to go uh, bring the gospel and build on another man's foundation. Paul was very careful of where he went because he didn't want to build on someone else's foundation. You know, if Peter went to one city, and Paul rolls up later and plants a church right next to his or whatever, that, that can cause some confusion, right? And so Paul's like, hey, I want to be careful. I heard that you guys were, were, you know, fighting the good fight up there, and I'm praying for you, uh, but I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. And so, but his purpose, his mission, you can say, was to preach the good news. And that's what the gospel means. Uh, people will say, what does the gospel mean? Well, it just means the good news, which is, is convenient or, or which is important for us because we live in a world that's full of bad news. Uh, we live in a society that you turn on the, the news channel and, and all you get is bad news, it seems. And I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong. It's good to be informed about what's happening in the world, but it's usually always bad. 
And then you get, you know, some, some other story about how a puppy got saved or something that makes you kind of feel good. And then, then the next story is, oh, another person was shot in this neighborhood or whatever, you know. And it's like, man, what kind of, I mean, the news is sometimes unbearable to watch because it's so sad. And yet Paul understood that I have something here that's good. The world, the world is bad. The world's got all these bad things happening in Paul's day. The Roman Empire were completely unfair to everyone who wasn't Rome or Roman. They oppressed people. They ripped people off. They threw people in jail, especially the Christians. They, they killed them. They did all these terrible things to Christians. There was all these bad things happening. And Paul says, I have the good news, and I'm going to spread it. I have a message of hope. I have a message of deliverance. I have a message that if I can bring it to the people and have them tell them they can be set free from their sins and they can go to heaven, they can have peace with God, then, man, that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's what Paul did. That's where he went on three missionary trips. He visited some churches. He preached the gospel. He spread the gospel where it needed to be spread. And so um, verse 2, it says, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, we're going to kind of uh, uh, address this a little bit later. Um, we'll address a little bit now and then kind of tie it in later. But one thing you need to understand is Paul did not invent the gospel. You know, the, the Pauline doctrine, people will say, or the, the Pauline theolo- the, you know, uh, theology. Uh, you'll hear all these different terms. You'll even hear people say, well, Paul uh, invented the gospel. He was the first one to, to kind of put in the phrase that Jesus came in the world. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead, you know, and kind of that, that structure that we would preach the gospel in. Paul did not invent the gospel. So you see, the gospel was preached all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. The fall of man, from the time that Adam and Eve sinned against God, God had a plan always to redeem people from their sin. And throughout the scriptures, throughout Genesis and all, you know, even the, the the five, first five books of the Bible, and you get into the judges and the kings and, and certainly the, the major prophets and, and the book of Psalms. All these scriptures, all the books that we have speak of God's plan for redemption. Man's sin, man's need for God, and God's remedy to that or, or, or redemption for that. And it speaks of that all the way from, from, from Genesis chapter 3. And so Paul didn't come up on the scene and you know, have some experience on the road to Damascus and then say, you know what, I'm going to invent this theology. I'm going to invent this religion. Now, we have religions where people have done that, right? Where supposedly men who saw some vision and saw something come down or saw, you know, all these different things happen and they're going to write it down and they've invented religions and people have done that. Paul didn't do that. Paul wasn't, didn't have some revelation that wasn't already backed by the scripture, backed by the prophets, and by, by the Old Testament. And so very important to understand that Paul did not invent the gospel, but he was a communicator of the gospel. He was someone that was going to spread it. Um, like I said, God's plan for all along was to, to redeem man. Um, one of my favorite um, passages, I shouldn't say that because there's, I'll probably say that about like 25 different passages, but If there was, like, if you had a time machine, which I know is not realistic, but if you could have a time machine for our sake, and there was, like, an event you would go back to in Jesus' day to where you could sit in the room and listen to him talk or listen to a teaching or watch a healing, there's a scene or there's a a story in Luke chapter 4, verse 17, um, where Jesus gets up in the synagogue and he opens up the scroll And he begins to read it, and you can turn there if you want. I wrote it down in my notes, so I'm going to read from there. But you can turn there in Luke uh, Luke chapter 4, and I believe it starts in 17. Um, Just look at your red letters. That's how I usually tell the kids. Wherever the red letters start. um, Jesus opens up the scroll, and he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, the word gospel, remember, is good news. Or you can say good tidings, or good, just good... Um, a good speech. He says, Jesus anointed, anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recover uh, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are uh, oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it says he closes the scroll, he hands it over, and he says, today the scripture is fulfilled. Pretty powerful. Well, what was that scripture? 
It's Isaiah 61. If you go to turn to Isaiah 61, you can read that same exact quote. Now, the difference is going to say, the, old, the, the Hebrew uh, word is going to say good tidings. Same word. Same, same, it's the Hebrew word of the gospel or the good news. So here Jesus is, is opening up a scroll written hundreds of years before Jesus would ever come on the scene, and he, write, and he reads directly from Isaiah, who wrote hundreds of years prior about a prophecy concerning him, and he closes up, he says, today this is fulfilled. What was the room like? Everybody knew that prophecy. Everyone knows the book of Isaiah who's sitting there. They know that that's a, that's a prophecy concerning the Messiah, that only God can fulfill that prophecy, that only God can come and preach the good news to the poor and heal the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and bring sight to the blind and, and set those uh, at liberty, those who are oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Only God can do that. So here Jesus is quoting a direct quote from Isaiah who wrote hundreds of years before and saying, today this is fulfilled. So I mention that because the gospel the good news, the message of, of God's redemption for the world, God's plan for, for humanity, God's love for people, God's desire to save people, isn't just in Paul's letters. It's not just in the New Testament. It's throughout the whole Bible. I think it was Warren Wearsby that said you can find Jesus on every page of the Bible. Now, I've never actually done that or tested that, um, you know, but I'm sure you probably could. You know, the, the point that he was making was that, listen, from Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation, you need to understand that the gospel, the good news, the plan for, for, for sin, uh, men and women's sins to be forgiven and to have us have a relationship with God was from the very beginning. God created us for that very purpose, right? He created us that we would, that we would walk with him, that we, Adam, Adam had uh, the, the advantage over all of us. He was able to walk with God in the garden in the cool of the day, I mean, God created him to, 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 for them to have communion, to have fellowship, to, to, so that Adam can worship God. There was, this, there was this plan of this relationship portion all along. And so, so Paul um, is, was an instrument used by God to proclaim the gospel, to spread the gospel, and he understood that it was even, uh, he was just fulfilling or, or, or continuing that promise that the prophets gave. So he says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. And so in his introduction, he's going to have throw some theology in there. And, and um, speaking of the lineage of, of Jesus, God becoming flesh, understanding that he had to come from the line of David, which the prophets talked about, which David, God told David that, you know, through your through your lineage, through your seed, through your throne will, will, will last forever. We know that David died, and, uh, and that was speaking of Jesus. So he was going to be from the seed of David according to the flesh, and then he says, declare to be the Son of God. And the, the phrase Son of God isn't like, you know, like my son is the son of Dustin, you know, um, where, you know, he's just, he's, my, he's mine because, you know, my wife gave birth to him, and we raise him, and we spank him, and all those things, right? Um, you know, but this would be a, 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 a direct phrase that would say he's the heir of God. He's, 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 there's God, and there's the Son of God, there's God, the Son of God, he's the, he's, he's, he's the heir of God. That, that he, though it says Son of God, it really is a phrase that would imply that he is God. He's the rightful, has the rightful place as God, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, this is important that Paul writes this. And it's important for us to understand what separates Christianity and the relationship that we have with God from the rest of other religions or whatever you want to call them, the rest of the world, is that Jesus rose from the dead. The power is in the resurrection. The, the truth is that Jesus did come into the world. He did teach as no one ever taught before. People said that. He speaks with such authority that we've had never heard before. He not only healed people, he not only taught with such great authority, he wasn't only the, the nicest person you could ever meet, he, he, he was tempted in every way and didn't sin, um, he, he, was, he was arrested, he was killed, but the important point is that he rose from the dead. Because you see, if you look at other pl things that people believe or they worship, you can look at Muhammad and he's dead, and you can dig up his bones. 
Now, that may cause a war if you try to do that, but you could do it. <laughs> you know, you could go, you can, you can Nostradamus, you know, Buddha, any of these, any of these men or women who somehow influence other people to believe some doctrine that they've created, you can go back and you can dig up their bones and find them. Guess what? You, you can search all day long and try to find Jesus' bones. You're never going to. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. And you, you, can, you can search far and wide, and you can search every, every square mile in the, whole, in the whole world. You will never find the bones of Jesus. You'll never find any, any, any uh, DNA or anything that would even associate that, that it, would, it would be reliable, at least, or credible to say that that was Jesus, because it's not there. He rose from the dead. And that's an important factor when we're preaching the gospel, because it's not just Jesus was a good person. You should believe in Jesus because he's good, because he says good things. You should believe in Jesus because he healed people. You should believe in Jesus because he said really cool things, and he was a great teacher. No, we believe in Jesus because he came in the world and died for our sins, and he rose from the dead. And he's the, has the, he showed the power of God. That's the difference. And so Paul, Paul rightfully puts, puts that statement, man, that we're according to the power of the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. So um, kind of a good, good statement there. In verse 7, he says, to all who are in Elk Grove. Now, you may have a different translation. Your translation may say Rome, but mine says Elk Grove here. I'm not sure why. But all who are in Rome, he says, beloved of God. You know, an endearing statement. Yeah, you're beloved by God. You need to know that. You need to know that God loves you and that you're his beloved. And then he says, called to be saints. Now, this is where you can really take that to be out because it's not that you um, somehow can, can get to saint status. When you receive Jesus in your life and he's forgiven you of your sins, he's washed you clean, you're a saint. Now, again, culturally and, 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 and church history's kind of corrupted this word in some sense, you know, and I think of this, I think of the, you know, the little statue on the, on the dashboard or, you know, the candles lit. And I had a friend who walked in, his, he had like, his grandma had like 70 candles lit and this is a saint for this and a saint for that and a saint for this. And, you know, that's how I associate it. And, but you are all saints. If you're a Christian, it just means the one set apart. So if you'd like a little bobblehead of me and you could put it on your dash, you know, say this is the saint of, I'm just kidding, don't do that. But, you know, we're saints. We're set apart. We're the called ones. We're the ones that, that, God, that God set us apart from the rest of the world. Said, look, you were a sinner and you deserve a certain judgment. You deserve, you deserved a certain um, punishment for your sin, but I paid for that sin. I washed you by my blood, and I purchased you my own precious blood, and I therefore separated you. I brought you out of the world and put you in the light and put you in the promise of God. We're saints. So powerful word. We've corrupted the word. We've made it something that it isn't, um, but you can call yourself saints. Now, don't expect me to call you a saint, but maybe someone will. Now, he says, he ends this. This is a traditional Paul introduction. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's something he writes in almost every letter. Um, with the exception of uh, Timothy and Titus, he adds the word mercy. But um, the grace and peace, you know, it's been said before, but understand that you cannot have the peace of God until you experience the grace of God. The, the, the word grace has to go first. You have to experience God's grace before you're going to experience his peace. And so... Um, there's also another thing where you have the, the Gentile greeting and the Hebrew greeting. Uh, you know, you have the word grace, uh, the, the Greek word. You would say that for the Gentiles you would, as an introduction or a hello or goodbye. You would say grace. And then um, for the Hebrews, you would say peace or shalom. Now, that's the introduction. So if you just took those first eight, eight verses, you can understand why maybe Barnhouse thought, you know what, I'm going to spend... 10 chapters just on the first eight verses. Now, I didn't read all 10 chapters. I don't have time. I mean, they're, they're very long. I'm sure they're very good, but I didn't have time to read them all. And I'm sure he makes some great points. Um, so it may be worth reading, but it may not be. I don't know. But it's a, lot, it's a lot of commentary for just a couple of verses. But you can see that just in this introduction, you, could, you can see the, the Paul's heart 
for the people. His, his, you know, he's setting up this foundation or this, this um, I, I want to be careful to say argument because I don't want to make it seem like Paul's writing some sort of, um, you know, this some sort of, uh, you know, apologetic class or something like that to where it's like, you know, he's trying to make some argument. He's just stating truths. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too when we talk about preaching the gospel. He's just stating things as, as they're true. Not as, I'm trying to convince you of this, I'm just telling you that this is true. You believe it or not, but it's true. So, he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your, sp- your, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, that's a pretty radical statement, right? I mean, not to say, I mean, it's like, okay, you can make an argument that there, a lot of the world wasn't known then. They didn't have social media. You know, there wasn't like a tweet that went out for the faith faithful in Rome or something like that. But to have the reputation that, man, these guys in Rome, man, they have the faith of God. It's a pretty radical statement. He says, you're known throughout the, all the world, really. People know of you. He says, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. And so Paul really expressing the love that he had for this church. Again, although he had never been there, he understood what they were going through. He understood that they were not in an easy situation, and so he was praying for them daily, uh, making mention of them in, um, in his prayers. He says, making request by some means now that at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Now, it's a little prophetic statement, right? Because you guys, if you guys know Paul's life, did he eventually get to Rome? He did, but it's not really how he wanted to, and we'll see that in a few verses, but what happened when he finally got to Rome? He died. So ultimately, he would end up in Rome as a prisoner, uh, you know, chained to a Roman guard in the palace, in the courts, or however, however you want to look at it, the Caesar's kind of section, you know, the political section, uh, where eventually he, he, would, he would be killed. And so he would get to Rome eventually, but, but not in the, in the way he, he, would, he thought. Uh, So then he says this, and this is why he wants to come. He says, for I long to see you. Um, Again, this is such an interesting expression for someone he's never met. He says, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift that you may be established. You see, Paul didn't want to go there to make a name for himself. He didn't want to go there and say, look, I'm Paul the Apostle. Okay, you know, put the flyers out, let people know I'm coming, you know, charge at the door, get the mission going, you know. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't some sort of thing where he wanted them to serve him. He wasn't saying, I'm, I can't wait to get to you guys so you guys can serve me. I mean, I heard you guys have some good coffee in Rome, some pour-overs and some pizza. You guys invented pizza yet? Like Italians, right? You know, meatballs. Heard you guys got good food, you know, whatever. Like, he wasn't, he wasn't writing so that, so that the people can serve him. He was writing saying, look, I want to come and establish some spiritual gift for you. I want to come minister to you. And not just give a, a, a material gift, not just give something that that's, isn't going to last or that's going to be temporary, but he wanted to impart something that only God can impart to someone, and that's a spiritual gift, something that's lasting. And you guys have experienced this. I have experienced this. I've been coming to this church since I got saved, and I've been, I've been benefited by the spiritual gift of, uh, that Rich has in Bible teaching. He has the gift of, bio, of, of teaching. And I've experienced it, and I've blessed by it, and I've grown from it, from from him imparting some spiritual gift to us or to me. I, I look at it as me, and he may be talking to you guys too, but I think he's talking to me most of the time. And and those things are valuable. Those things, if the building goes away, if the the chairs fall apart, if you know the 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 city decides you know we we don't want you guys meeting anymore, your conditional use permit is taken away. Um, if I get fired, hopefully not, but if I do, um, those things that were imparted to me, the spiritual part, those things are going to last forever. Those things can't go away. The lessons that I've learned, the things that I've been, been taught, the things that I've been able to see and grow from, those things are a blessing. And, and you guys have experienced those things, and, and you've imparted those in, in, into other people, those spiritual gifts. And I would encourage you you know, material gifts are, can be a blessing, and they are. Sometimes the Lord uses, prompts you, you know, if someone has a, um, you know, a great gift in that way to be able to maybe um, bless someone financially or whatever the case may be, there, there can be many blessings for that. 
But there's nothing like using your spiritual gifts that God's given you. There's nothing like talking with someone and God giving you a word of wisdom or talking with someone or, or someone talking to you and then God giving them a word of knowledge or a word for you. And then you hear it and you're like, whoa, that guy, would he, he never knew I was going through that. So Paul was wanting to do that to us so that they can be established. And then he says this, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith that we both have. Let me tell you guys something. There is nothing like being a Christian. Now, I don't know what kind of sports teams you follow. Mine have been disappointed me for a long time now. But I don't know which ones to dis- have you guys follow. And I don't know, maybe some of you guys are Warriors fans, and you know the disappointment of last year, but then you think of the year before that. Or maybe you're Cleveland fans. You think, oh, man, the championship. We finally brought it to Cleveland. You know, and there's this excitement. And, you know, you, you know, I remember being at the airport one time with Rich, and he had a Boston Red Sox hat on, and we're, like, on one side of the airport walking this way, and this other guy is going the opposite direction. There's hundreds of people at this airport, and I hear this guy, Go Sox! And I'm like, what the heck what was that? You know, and this guy's some fan, sees Rich's hat through the pile of people, and he feels the expression just to yell out, Go Sox! I'm like, this is some weird. Red Sox fans are weird, Right? <laughs> So I don't know what team you follow, what you're into, but listen, when you surround yourselves with people who love Jesus and you walk with the Lord for a certain amount of time and you start to develop those friendships and you start to create this fellowship and this communion with other people, there's nothing like it. When you hear of someone, what they're going through or what they're doing in a different city or you have friends who, who maybe are, are are serving in different areas, or you hear that maybe God's using this person in, in, in some area of, of their life, or whatever it may be, the joy that comes from that, that fellowship. You know, um, uh, you know we've, we've been involved in many different missions, and, and it's just always such a blessing to hear updates, to say, man, the Lord's doing this, or the Lord's doing that, or this person said hi, or that person says, you know, you know, we wish we could see you. You know, Rich shows the videos of the guys at the school sharing messages to us. And most of you guys will never meet those guys. And yet they feel the love. They feel like their, their home church is Calvary Chapel Laguna Creek and Calvary Chapel Vero. Their pastors are Jim and Rich. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're just as much, they feel as much part of our fellowship as if they were here because of that love, that, that, that encouragement that we've been able to have with them over the years, the mutual faith. So I encourage you, surround yourself with some friends, man, that, that walk by faith. You be a person that walks by faith, and you will never have a dull moment as a Christian. You know, you'll, Christianity is one of the most exciting things in the whole world. You know, before, before the age of, of 30, which I'll be 31 soon, so I'm going to say 30. You know, by the time I got saved at almost 17 to 31-ish, 30 years old, you know, I've been able to go to, you know, Malaysia, Ghana, um, you know, Ukraine, Belgrade, Hungary. I mean, I mean, I think I counted one time it was like 13 different countries or something like that. And listen, that's not to be boastful and like, oh, I went to all these countries because, listen, I ain't nothing to boast about it. Being on a plane that long is miserable, getting sick. I got, this, I got weird things on my leg that grow. You don't want, to, you want any part of that, okay? So it's not glamorous, you know, oh, you travel a lot. It's like, yeah, you want to go? Like, you want to go instead? You know, but the point is, is listen, following Jesus, I've never had a dull moment. Watching God work and watching, hearing the things that God does in people's lives, man, is such a great joy. And so Paul felt that. He says, man, I haven't met you guys. I haven't been there, but man, we need to go. We, I need to go there. We're involved in Ukraine because Rich went to Ukraine, never had been there before, didn't know anyone except for he found out that he knew one person there uh, really well. And he gets back and he says, dude, you got to go. And he was telling me about the work that was happening. And he was like, we got to go. Well, that was five, four or five years ago. He's never been back. And I've gone four, four or five times. And so I went going, not ever had gone, not knowing anyone, but hearing of their faith, hearing of the work of God and being excited. And so um, such a great, a great little, little statement. And we'll finish up here. He says, He says, now that I want you to be aware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you, that I might have some, uh, but it was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as just as 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 with the other Gentiles. So, you know, if if uh, if you're someone who kind of plans something and doesn't work out, you're in the same boat as Paul. So be encouraged. 
Um, it's not really encouraging when you plan something and God closes the door. It's like, Lord, are you sure? And then he says this, I'm both a debtor, uh, I'm a debtor to both the Greeks and the barbarians. Barbarians would be a word uh, used for anyone who didn't speak Greek, uh, to the wise and to the unwise, to the educated and to the, uh, to the uneducated. And, and Paul's heart is that he felt that he had a certain debt. You know, you guys know Paul's story. For time's sake, we won't get completely into it. But Paul persecuted the church. He was, he was against the work of Jesus or the, 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 you know, the, the Jesus movement happening. He was against it. Uh, he, he was responsible for putting Christians in jail, being killed. Um, he held the coats while they stoned Stephen. You know, Paul has this, is this radical, zealous dude for the law, and God saves him. And he felt since that point that he had a certain debt that he owed or something. I don't know, you know how, how, you, how you phrase it. But he felt like, you know what, because what God saved me from, i got to preach the gospel to everybody. Every person I'm indebted to, they need to know the gospel. And so he did that. And so he says this, So much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to all who are in Rome also. You see, Paul had a certain readiness to proclaim the good news. It wasn't that he was thinking, you know what, I gotta, I gotta really work up. I gotta kind of get in the mood. I kind of, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go to this class, this four week class, or I'll go to, the, you know, kind of gear up. Paul was ready. He was ready to preach the gospel. He felt that, look, if there's someone out there that doesn't know Jesus, they need to know Jesus, and I'm ready to go. And because then he says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for any, to, for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And I think this is the key. And this is what I want to end, the point and the application I want to end with tonight, is that Paul was ready to preach the gospel because he understood something. He understood that it's the power of God to salvation for anyone who would believe. You see, Paul didn't get into debates about the gospel. I mean, there are some cases, you know, uh, where, you know, I think Mars Hill, there's a couple other places, you know, but, but most of the time, he didn't try to convince or argue the fact that God was real, that Jesus came and he died for the sins. He preached the gospel and he just shared it because it's true. He told the Corinthians, I didn't desire to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. I didn't speak to you with, with, with great speech or elegancy or like some sort of, I wasn't some dynamic teacher but I told you, and I preach the simplicity that's in Christ, that Jesus Christ wrote, died for our sins and rose from the dead. And that was the power of his message. The power of the message, and, and don't, get, don't misunderstand me, there's a time and place to try to convince somebody that there's a God, that God loves them. You know, all those things are true. But for the gospel's sake, it's the power of God, right? The power of God to salvation, that if you just preach the gospel, if you spend most of your time just preaching the gospel, it is going to have a bigger impact than you trying to argue theology or argue some what word means or what this thing means or what that thing means. Just preach the gospel. Just tell people Jesus loves them so much that he sent, that God sent his son in the world to die for their sins, that if anybody would believe him, they would, they would not perish but have everlasting life and walk away. <laughs> you know, it blow their mind, Right? When you got, when, I, would, I would assume, maybe not all of you, so I don't want to overstate something, but most of us in this room, when we got saved, I got saved pretty much in a Bible study, and the Bible teacher did not somehow give me some 10-point some reason why there's a God or 10-point reason why, um, you know, these certain things happen. He got up and said, listen, God thinks you're awesome, and he thinks you're special, and he loves you, and despite what you've done or what you think you've done, God still loves you and still died for your sins, and he still rose from the dead, and that whether you believe him or not, it doesn't change the fact that those things are true. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So Paul understood that the preaching of the gospel, the good news, for it is the power of God, first to the, the Jew, we know that Paul first would preach to the, to the synagogues, but then also that, that extension or that, that um, you know, the gospel is, is to everyone, to the Greek. He says, for it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for it is written, the just shall live by faith. We're saved by faith. We're saved by faith in Jesus. Not of works, not of anything I can do. There's no amount of money I could pay. There's no amount of works I can, I can you know, muster up, but I 
am saved and I'm made just by faith, that my sins are forgiven because I simply believed in Jesus. And I want to encourage you, you know, because many of us would say, well, I don't know how to preach the gospel. You know, I'm not Greg Laurie, or I'm not Billy Graham, or I'm not whoever we think of when we, talk, when we think of evangelists or, or preaching the gospel. Listen, the gospel is not a new message. The gospel is not something that Paul invented and that Paul patented, and the only person who could preach it is Paul. No, it's not true. Isaiah preached the gospel. Jeremiah preached the gospel. Moses preached the gospel. Joshua preached the gospel. There, there, there's scriptures, the, the prophets in the Old Testament speak of, of the need for God's, the need for, for, for man, the, the need that, that man has for God and the forgiveness of sins. And the, Old, the New Testament gives us what happened. There's sin, we need God, and guess what? God sent Jesus. And Jesus was the propitiation for our sins, and not only for my sins or your sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And that by believing in him, that our sins could be forgiven, and we could be made right with God, and we can have the promise and the hope of heaven because of what Jesus did. That's a message from Genesis chapter 3. So my encouragement to you tonight is don't get caught up in complicating the gospel. Just preach the gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation. Paul was ready. He was ready to tell people. He felt like he was indebted. That if I don't tell you, I'm ripping you off. If I don't tell you about the good news, if I don't tell you about Jesus, I'm doing a disservice to you because it's, because it's the power of God and the salvation. You could be saved because God loves us. And so it's a simple message. We just have to preach it. If you're, you know, if you're into the debating the theology and the eschatology and the other ologies that I don't know how to say, um, go for it. You know, that maybe God's given you that, that open door, that, that gift. Um, for me, I can't even say half those words. So I'm just going to stick with, look, man, I don't, know, I don't know what you just said, but Jesus loves you. Die for your sins. And he rose from the dead, and you're gonna, you can only go to heaven if you believe in him. And I'm going to walk away and hopefully not, like, throw up when I say it. <laughs> right? We, you know, I get nervous still. I get nervous just being here. I get nervous with the kids. You know, those kids are tough, man. They, are, they know. They know, like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you know what? Your mom's here. Just kidding. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for making it so simple for us. Lord, we're here tonight. I'm assuming that we're here tonight because we've heard the, the gospel and we heard the good news and we heard that we can receive it and there wasn't anything that we had to do but just receive it by, in, by faith. And Lord, we understood that, it, that the power of that message, the power of the simplicity that's in you saved us, Lord. It made us reason with you. It made us, it made us consider our own selves and our need for you and made us turn to you and repent. And so we thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that we wouldn't forget that that same message that we heard whenever that day was, that same message is true today and just as powerful for someone else who doesn't know it and just as meaningful and just as truthful and just, just as, as loving and gracious as it when we heard it. Lord, help us to preach it to others and to tell everyone, Lord, of this great need that they have for you, Jesus. So uh, thank you again, just making it simple for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.